All right, let's talk some of the non-stock stuff today. We do have some pretty good action elsewhere, including a crude oil continuing its ascent above $80. Let's do it with Bob Iaccino, founder, chief strategist of Path Trading Partners. Bob, WTI breaking loose here? Yeah, and it's been, uh, OJ, we, I haven't talked to you about this in a little while, yeah. but I, I've been long Too crude long. oil. I got long crude oil. And it's starting to get into that point of time where, believe it or not, the seasonal strength starts about now. So that's number one. Number two, you're starting to get some optimism about Chinese demand. I personally think it's based off of the idea that the globe is about to get a lot looser in monetary policy, uh, Japan excluded, although it's still very loose. And that could help with exports from China to other countries and help boost their demand a little bit, plus the stimulus they've done already. So, you know, the, the idea that crude oil was going to stay down here based off of weak demand and the, the, that the demand was never going to catch up sort of is contrary to the reflation narrative for the U.S. economy and the global economy in general, which might be pulling the Fed back from as many rate hikes as the market had priced in, at least the seven they had priced in uh, in May of last year when they had it priced in at that point. You know, the uh, potential for crude to push uh, further from here, uh, even with, you know, we went through this phase where there were cuts from the Saudis and OPEC, but the U.S. kept gushing. So it kind of seems like some of that would kind of work through potentially, uh, uh, you know, kind of both sides of the supply equation. Should we be interpreting this as like pure demand, like China coming back online and U.S. hanging in there? I mean, slightly, yes. I mean, again, we've talked in the past about the long term prospects for U.S. supply, which is not good. Medium to long term, it's not good. They haven't been reinvesting in wells. Now, having said that, if you get prices at these levels, somebody like, say, a Diamondback Energy, FANG, does really, really well and might actually start to invest CapEx into new wells. But, you know, you're talking about anywhere from uh, most optimistic 18 months to three years before they start to produce. Now, the Saudis, yes, they extended their production cuts, but only recently in the last few days have we seen some of the countries, uh, Iraq specifically, say they would now finally comply with those cuts. They hadn't been complying. The supply had been over what the production limits were set at by OPEC plus. Obviously, Russia is not going to abide by it. Of course, you have the drone strike, the Ukrainian drone strikes on Russian refineries, which took out about 600,000 barrels a day of production. So when you combine all these things with the idea that economies, specifically the U.S., may be reflating and that China's stimulus will work at some point, I don't know to what level, you're getting this slow sort of a, this is clearly a melt up that we're seeing here. Okay. Yeah. The, I was just literally thinking about that uh, reflation, kind of ranking the risks reflation versus recession, and then just kind of risk appetite too, right? The third one, which is, um, does it just stop for no reason when you're <laughs> kind of doing what we're doing in risk assets? You know, that can happen, right? You can just kind of blow off a top and then, uh, which kind of brings us to some of the other stuff. Uh, gold under some pressure today, uh, Bitcoin down, outright down, dollar really firm, even with Bank of Japan trying to play hardball or whatever their version of that is. The Japan thing was one of my favorite to talk about today. Wolf Richter, who is the founder of Wolf Street, put it best in the story he wrote last night. He said the Bank of Japan keeps making its loosest ever monetary policy slightly less loose in tiny steps at the slowest ever snail's pace. So clearly Japan um, disappointed the markets and you saw that reaction in the yen. Gold, on the other hand, down a little bit more than 2% since that $2,203 all-time high. Again, I would argue that's holding in. And I think a lot of people, myself included, think that the Fed should not cut rates, but they will in 2024, even though they shouldn't. Mm. So that's gonna hold gold somewhere in this upper level, uh, clearly in my view, above 2,000, but even if it gets below there, you're not talking anywhere south of 1950 in the near future, in my opinion. I'm, of course, long gold from way lower than that. We've been talking yes. about that yeah, you for about 16 the gold trade. months. Very nice trade. Yeah, so I've still got that trade on, rolling the futures and keeping the physical. And then when you talk about something like Bitcoin, specifically crypto in general, it's funny because when you look at Bitcoin, you and I have talked for years about its correlation to the NASDAQ. 
Jim Bianco had a great chart the other day. You may have seen it, OJ, mm. where he lined up the triple leverage QQQ with Bitcoin and you couldn't tell the difference. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Saw you couldn't that. tell the difference. They were still identical. So it still seems to me to be too correlated to the NASDAQ to be what the true believers think it is. Now, having said that, I think we're in a reflation scenario and the best performers, if you look at an equity sector back test, is going to be energy and it's going to be tech. So you're going to see a NASDAQ rally and you're likely to see a Bitcoin rally if I'm right about that. OK, yeah, good point. I always like the uh, chart work and uh, the thoughts, Bob. Appreciate the macro uh, discussion there. Holding on to the gold, great trade in gold. Uh, and uh, we'll be watching the overlay between risk assets, stocks, and BTC. Thanks, Bob, founder, chief strategist, path trading partners.